going to talk about hornbeams and how we produce them. I brought you to this big beast because this was lifted from the ground with a digger. If you remember, we did a video. This was lifted last year in 2020. It was in April 2020. We dug it up and we put this in this great big pot and you can see the growth. All these were new branches which were grown from scratch. So they're so easy to grow. And because they're so prolific, you have to keep removing these small branches. You don't want all these small branches to grow. So you've got to be keeping on top of it and just keep the branches that you want to grow so that you get the pads in the right place. So all these small things will have to continually be chopped off and taken off and just concentrate on the main branches. So the taper, taper is there. If you come around here, you can see the big cut which was made here about 20 years ago. This tree, by the way, is about 36 years from planting in the ground. So total age is only about 40. So you can see at the back where the first cut was made, then another cut was made here, then another cut was made there. And that's how we build the taper up. So this tree is well on its way. See all these new branches springing upwards. I'll have to cut them off. I don't want them. There are too many here. So we just concentrate on making the shape. And hopefully one day some person will like this big tree and uh, hopefully buy it. So this is how we make these big horn beams. Now, the horn beams are very easy to air layer. So instead of having to dig it up from the ground, another easy way of making uh, large trees is by air layering, as I've shown you before. So I'm now going to take you to our main hornbeam area where we grow them in the ground, but we also air layer them. So this is my main hornbeam growing area. You can see them, they're all different sizes, different heights. And you will also notice that these trees are actually shaped like bonsai. So by pruning in the right place, I can get them to shape like a bonsai. And then I will air layer them in precisely the uh, position that I want them to grow. So look at this one. Look at, if you look at this one, come concentrate on this one, you can see the nice curly shape there is there. And it will be quite easy ex to explain to you how we make the bonsais by air layering. So if you come close here, you will see that this curly part that the branches grow so easily I'm not worried at all they will grow again so the bonds I'm going to air layer will be made from here this part here so I'm going to air layer here and I'll get a nice curly bonsai same with this one with this curly trunk I can easily air layer from here to there and get a nice bonsai from there. So this is how these trees are grown. They're grown specifically for air layering and nothing else. And when we get to the bottom, we will probably dig the trees up. So let's walk around here. You can see how all these horn beams are being developed. Now this one, I cut the top off. So I'm just going to concentrate on the base. And this is the new leader which is coming up. And if I want to make a small bonsai from this one, I can easily do that. You can see, just by pruning in the right place. So this one will make a nice bonsai here if I want to air layer it. And then the base will become another bonsai with a big trunk. If we go along here, you will see more trees, all different stages of growing. And you can see how interesting the trunks are. So they've all been trimmed so that they give a nice S shape. Now these air layerings, you must be wondering what's happening here. You will see that there are quite a few air layerings here. Many, many air layerings. And because the hornbeam is so easy to propagate from air layerings, I do them throughout the year. The best time to start the air layering is in April, which is now April, May, June. And if you do them correctly, they will root in six weeks. 
So if I do them in April, by June, I will get all the roots there. These, by the way, were done in late autumn, September, maybe even early October. And let's see what has happened to them, because they're easy to root. I will just look at some of them. So let us go to this one, for instance. I can already see some roots there. If you look at the tree, if you look carefully, you can see the roots coming out from there. So this is going to be almost a perfect tree. It's not a small tree either. Virtually all the branches are there. See, I could even make more bonsai from the top, should I wish. But, you know, there's a limit to how much you can keep cutting and waiting and making. So I may not even bother to use that top there, although the top there is useful as a bonsai. So let me not waste too much of my time. Oh, let's use the saw, which is here. So I want to keep the bonsai here. So let's get rid of this. So off with the top. Now these branches are too thick. If I leave them, you will get inverse taper. So I'm going to get rid of them. So sometimes it may be tempting to keep it, but no. You've got to know what the tree will put, do. And I know that that will cause inverse taper, so I'm going to get rid of these. So many thorns get tripping over it. Already there is inverse tape, I can see already. So get rid of that. And hey presto, we've got the bonsai here. These I can keep as sacrificials to make a uh, thicker base. Now let's tidy this up a little bit so it's more recognizable. And I'm going to cut it over here. And then I will open the bag and show you the roots. So this was earlier in September and already I've got roots. So let's open it. I've never opened it yet, but I will show you. You see, I don't tie string or anything. I just tied with a piece of wire. How easy is that? How easy is that? And let's have a look. I shouldn't really be doing it here. I should take it back to the nursery to show you. But look at the roots. Can you see the roots there? Can you see the roots? That should be okay to pot up and that will form a new tree. So we discarded this, we didn't want that. So let's go and look at some of the other ones. It's really just to show you the principle really. You got to look at all of them. Not all of them may have rooted. Now this one has roots. If you come here we will look at it. Can you see the roots on the side here? See the roots is coming in the bag. So that has rooted, that's rooted, I can take it off. And this also has rooted. Can you see what a lot of roots in here? Look at all those roots, masses of roots. So this has well rooted, well rooted. So this is another good one. This one again has rooted. Let me perhaps open this one. It's too much plastic. See, we've used this piece of wire, which is so convenient. Look at the roots. So this is it. So that's a nice base. And this is going to be that S-shaped bonsai. I can cut the tree there and get a nice S-shaped tree. So all these can be separated and potted up. It's a very cold, windy day. I'll just show you how I'm going to uh, get the shape from that tree. So there is an S shape over there. This is not going to be much use. Now 
Now, you could, if you wanted to make a straight tree going that way and using this as a taper, but for those of you who are new to bonsai, they don't understand what inverse taper is. You see, there's so many branches here. This has become very thick. So the taper is not looking very good there. So this is where you've got to get rid of the bits, too many branches, because if you have too many branches, you get inverse taper and it will spoil the look of the tree. You'll get a bulge in the middle of the trunk where you don't really want it. So you see where I cut, I've got this nice S-shaped bonsai from there to there. And maybe some of these I also don't need. That will also cause inverse taper. These thick branches can also cause inverse taper. So all we need is that S shape. And I, in fact, should refine this even more because you see how bulgy it is there. It should really appear like that. So this is rooted, but I will separate it later on. So most of these have rooted. Uh, so if we move along here, you can see how I've been shaping the branches. Look at that tree. I've cut in the right place, so I get a nice S-shaped bonsai from there. So these have been purposely pruned so that they produce the shape of the bonsai. And just by air layering, I'm going to get the bonsai in the right place. This is another good example, but this is an example of an air layering that probably didn't quite work. You look at the this is called callousing. The bag is still there. The bag is still there. It tried to produce roots, but I think the birds took all the moss away. So because the birds took the moss away, the roots could not form. But if I now make the air layering again, I'll get a beautiful base. I'll get a bonsai that high. And here you are, a ready-made bonsai, just by shaping the tree and air layering. Same again here. If you look here, that may be an airing again, but that didn't succeed. That would have been too big, but I think the bonsai should be somewhere here. So I should do a bonsai airing from this point to get that tree and do another airing from here. So I'll get about three different trees. That's also another bonsai there. So there's lots of potential bonsai here. So this is how we use our horn beams for airing. And you can see that no end of material here. No end of material that we can use. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this video on air layering with our horn beams. So I'm now going to show you the process right through because the transition, what we can call the transition from cutting it off from the tree to putting in a pot is quite tricky. Now I have here this one, this hornbeam, was severed from the parent tree in September of 2020. And I haven't had a look at it. It was put in this pot and let's see how much root it will have made since September. And there you go. Look at all those roots. Complete root ball since September 2020 to April. And the tree is growing well. So this is the air layering from the hornbeam. Because it's in the greenhouse, it's already leafing. And you notice that I planted it in pure sphagnum moss. All this is sphagnum moss. I know it's expensive, but it's worth it. If you plant it in anything else, it is not so successful. Look at all that moss. See, this is what is growing because the moss encourages the roots to literally go right through the root ball and fill the pot. So the moss, as I say, may be an expensive commodity, but it's worth every penny. I've tried using planting straight in the peat or the compost but it's not always successful. I will show you an example of a failure because I like to show you the failures because sometimes you do get failures. Now, when we put it in a pot, I don't put it in any old pot. I've got so many plastic pots around. Why do you think that was 
planted in this deep ceramic pot. Because this ceramic pot is heavy, it's not likely to topple over. If I were now to plant these in a plastic pot, the chances are the pot may not be sturdy enough to support the tree. It is possible, but it may not support the tree. So if I have a tall tree, I usually use these heavy ceramic pots because I only need to wait three or four months and it will fill the entire pot with roots. So you can see what I did. I just put that root ball in there and I'm just going to fill it with moss. Don't be tempted to use soil. I'm not saying that soil is not successful. It will work, but there's always a risk it may not work, especially if you use very heavy soil. But I prefer to use my well and trusted sphagnum moss trick because I know that you can see the results planted in that sphagnum moss. What a lot of beautiful roots you can get. So that's what I do, just putting straight moss in the pot, fill it quite firmly. I'm not breaking the roots because that root ball is intact. So that, that plastic pot, okay, it's not toppling over, so that's all right. Now this one, maybe I'll use this deep pot because this is quite a tall tree. So let's take this out. So hey presto, as I said, that's all you need. You see there's quite a lot of root there. And that will go in there. I can even leave the plastic if I want to, there's no harm because I can always remove it at a later date, but I didn't want to break the roots. Okay, I've removed it, so again, all I do is put moss in there. So that is my substitute for compost. The moss is literally being used as compost. And because it's quite light and not heavy, the roots will just shoot through. And what do I do with this? I need to water it. And I also usually stand it in a tray of water. Now let me take you, if you follow me, this is where some of the other air layerings are stored. This is the tray where we stand our air layerings. So these are juniper air layerings and they're standing in this tray. And I fill the tray with just about half inch or one inch of water. And there are many air layerings in here. This is a Arakawa air layering. This was done last year. And I think I severed this in September or October of last year. And I know for a fact that this will have also rooted and the pot I filled with sphagnum moss. Let's see the results. Look at the roots. Look at the roots on that. So, and the moss is still there. And I'm now going to transfer this into ordinary flower pot with proper soil. So I don't need to do any more to that. Same thing with these junipers. They've all rooted. You can see what thick, thick air layerings I made of these junipers. So these have all rooted as well. And while I'm there, if you stay here, I will just go in there. I'll show you another air layering that we separated last September. And you will see it's quite a tall tree. This was, oh, this is for YouTube video. There you are. Another hornbeam air layering that we separated. And this again, I don't need to take it out. It's full of roots. So there you go. 
I don't want to damage it in any way and maybe tied in. No, it's tied in. It's tied in. There you are. There's got enough root in there, but it's growing well. So this air layering as well. And of course the beauty is of air layering is that you don't get these heavy roots that you get when you dig, uh, grow in the ground. Because when you dig in the gr ground, you have to separate those thick, hard roots, which doesn't produce good nibari. Now let me show you some failures that we have. Now these failures were done as an experiment. I mean, I didn't want it to fail, but I did it out of sheer interest. And these were two big dishojos that I aired from my front garden, these ones. And you can see that they're not growing, whereas there, that big five meter tall maple, if you remember, this was an air layering cut off in September 2019. And that was five meter high to cut about 10 feet off to fit the greenhouse. Now these two deshojos did not succeed. And the reason being, I will show you, I used ordinary peat and bark and not sphagnum moss. And because I used peat and bark, these trees did not grow properly. They did not send the roots. Same with this one. You can see that I used, again, peat and bark. Let me remove it. What a shame, because I would have had two big deshojo trees. But sometimes you've got to try these experiments just to see what works and what doesn't work. So there you are. You can see that it had root. Look at that root ball. It had plenty root there, lots of root. But because I planted it in peat and bark instead of sphagnum moss, it was not successful. So there was a useful lesson I learned. So I hope you've learned something and keep learning from all these videos about air layering and how we make bonsai from air layering.